Each ring that I might make has a different formation and again it becomes unique to the wearer or the owner of the piece. You'll never get two that are the same. Any jeweller will tell you that they're learning all the time. There's always new stuff coming in, there's new technologies, there's new ways of doing things. When I was a child, I used to go visit in my cousin's house most weekends and they lived in the middle of nowhere and their daddy was an electrician. He used to bring like random bits of copper wire, you know, with the lovely yellow and red and brown tubing on the outside and we used to make bracelets from it. So we would have like a length of silver and then basically wrapping what I would call jump rings now. So we're wrapping this wire around wire and then just randomly tying it at the end. So they were sort of like wee friendship bracelets, things like that. As the years went by then, I would have studied my diploma in art and design in Derry, but I always found I was kind of useless at everything except jewellery making. So I love the solder and I love the hammering. You feel really at one with the piece that you're making, I suppose because you're putting your heart and your soul into it as well. I also went and worked for a jeweller in Donegal Town. He was really established. His name was Nile Britton and he showed me a lot of techniques, polishing and filing and things like that. If you're soldering, the heat of the solder needs to be the same as the heat of the metal. So the two need to sort of be the exact same heat at the one time in order for the solder to run. You find as well that if you put too much heat on something, you're, I mean, you're going to burn the ends. So it's just knowing when to pull back. With your metals, like there's such a difference between working with gold and working with silver. You can sort of push the silver to the limits or push the gold to the limits as well. And I find that when I'm doing like melted down pieces, specifically rings, I can play with the metal as it's molten. So it's quite interesting because I feel a lot of the time the metal has its own mind. And although you want it to do one thing, it'll do something else. My work looks at Irish culture as a concept. I would have studied Irish culture, but the nicer side of Irish culture, not religion or politics. So the lighter side, specifically traditions and ritualistic themes that are sort of lost in the past. The things that I would have worked on then, a collection of work over those three years, that's my basis. So everything I did then, there's a touch of it in my work now. The arm and arm pendant, it's sort of like the Irish blessing you'll always have friends in your life. So the thinking is it symbolises two little linking arms. If you're having a bad day, you can link out your arm and you'll always have a mate to link on and skip down the road with you. So it represents the solidarity of friendship, two linking arms that you'll always have somebody who has your back. Forming on the mandrel, the first form is just basically with the rawhide mallet I'm just battering the ring to make it look ring-like. The second formation, I'm texturing it, so I'm hitting it with a different hammer that has a textured edge on it. There's a lot of soldering in this piece because I'm opening rings and closing rings. Because it's square wire, I always have this sort of a point on each side, so I file both the inside sides of it and then I file on the outside. With this piece in particular, you don't really need to polish because of the textured edges, it's sort of light reflective, so I use the finer 1200 grade as a polishing paper, if you like, and then I put it into the tumbler and that just gives it a little bit of bling. In Irish culture, three sevens and nines were considered lucky numbers. So this piece is made with three balls and it has three ends on each side as well. It's more like the more traditional forms. I try to stay away from traditional Irish forms, but in this case, I sort of give it my own wee style, if you like. You see the triquetra and it has basically three lines of silver and I use six and I leave the outer ends open just to give it my own wee sort of stamp on it. So the focus is on the three balls in the centre, so it's like lucky number three, if you like. The Celtic spiral, again, is very familiar to Irish art. So this, for me, it would have been taken off the Welcome Stone at Newgrange. It's three spirals, but instead of doing full spirals, what I've done is just sort of focused in on parts of the spiral. So it's like they're falling off the silver. What I do is etch and it. The etching process takes about maybe eight hours, depending on how deep you want your etch. Set on a little stone set, which will be an amethyst, and then solder on a wee ring again so that the chain can go through it. Again, going through the oxidization process, which is basically blackening the piece and polishing it up. The blackener again just sits into the grooves, highlighting the spirals. 
my design work is all on my own and I would take poetry, things like that, from the likes of Seamus Heaney and make pieces from his words as well. So taking words, taking somewhere I've been, taking something I've seen, a thought, taking a bit of your soul and making it in jewellery form. I would do St Bridget's Cross, which has been done a million times over by different artists. I concentrate on the centre of the weave. I weave the whole thing around itself and I weave it back in on itself so it doesn't look like your standard St Bridget's Cross. It looks like my version of the cross, which I call Blue Biddy. There's no great process bar the weaving. It's the main process. I use one bit of solder and just um, around the loop so the chain goes in through it and it holds in place. You can't solder that piece for me personally. I, I mean, I wouldn't solder it because um, it needs to be woven and it needs to be as near to the weaving of St. Bridget's Cross and Rushes as possible. My favourite piece at the minute, I've had many over the years that I've sold, is this piece called Iha Nagiha Moor, which means Night of the Big Wind. So back in the 1800s, a great hurricane came through Ireland. The people at the time, obviously there's no social media or things, they didn't know how bad this was going to be. So the fishermen went on out to sea and they did their thing and people tend to think it was just a bad wind. And what happened was walls were blown over, people lost their lives at sea. This piece in particular is based on an extract that I'd read and basically it was saying that in Carrick Fergus graveyard a big tree uprooted and the body started rising up to the, the surface of the ground. The people of Ireland thought that this hurricane was like the rapture, it was God punishing them. So what I've done is I have little crosses rising into the sky, so it parallels with the bodies rising from the ground and the rapture, if you like. The red stone that I've set in the centre is a garnet, so it's the thinking that it might be a vengeful God who's paying the people of Ireland back, which is what they thought at the time. And then the three spirals coming in represent the wind. I would cast my bigger pieces because when you're spending 10 to 15 hours work making one piece, it's not practical. It's grand if you're making one every so many months, but when there's a demand for this one piece, for me personally, it's not practical to be sitting down to do that. So for a bigger piece that I would sell quite often, I would get a cast. For pieces that are more one-off, I would do them individually. I tend to, for my personal commissions, to not do design work for them or to do minimal design work because if I made one piece and I went to make it again, I would like it to be slightly different from the first piece. And again, it just gives that uniqueness to each piece. The thing about casting as well is, depending on who you're dealing with, sometimes you get pieces back that maybe haven't fully cast or there's certain pits in the silver, there's lines where there shouldn't be lines and you're up against issues like that where you might spend just as long filing out lines, filling in holes than you might do making it from scratch yourself. So with the casting pieces, from a retail level, it's practical and with the more one-off pieces, I would just tend to make them all by hand from scratch. You're told to do things one way, but sometimes you're questioning what if it goes wrong or when it does go wrong, how do you reverse it to make it right, if you like. So again, it's always trial and error. It's always a learning experience. I suppose when I think about craftsmanship, I picture just somebody working with their hands and taking an idea from scratch, working their way through maybe different processes and coming out with a final piece that they're happy with, that they're proud of. For me, when I'm looking back and if I'm doing pieces, it's putting your heart and your soul into your work and your blood, sweat and tears are in that. And I suppose when people come to buy that or maybe look at that or view it, they can see the craftsmanship that's in it and they don't mind paying maybe the money because they can see the work that goes into it. I think with a lot of jewellery these days, it's quite generic and although it's maybe beautiful, you can tell it's been made by a machine. I think if you lined up a piece from a jeweller's and a piece of, say, my work or any other jeweller's work, you can tell the difference. You know which piece was handmade 